Banjo-Kazooie, what a f game. Despite having never heard of it before, I was sold in the first five minutes. I mean, look at this! Of course, the fact that it came bundled with the t-shirt and the CD of the soundtrack, that was pretty nice, too. Super Mario 64 may be where the 3D platforming collectathon thing started, but Banjo-Kazooie improved on the formula in many ways. For example, collecting a jiggy didn't teleport you out of the world you were in, flying was easier, good lord was it ever, you had many more ways to defend yourself, no two worlds had the same music or even remotely the same atmosphere, Grunty's non-stop taunting and rhymes, dozens of characters to interact with, transformation Jinjos, intro theme song, the whole thing just felt great. Even when it was ugly, it was great. It had that certain atmosphere to it that made you want to come back and play it again and again. And you're always learning new ways to do things and get around. It's pretty rare for you to stumble across anything even remotely resembling a human being in this game, which adds to the whole backwoods atmosphere of it. And of course, I would be remiss not to mention what may well be the game's biggest strength, its soundtrack. Grant Kirkhope, you are an absolute god. When Rare first jumped on with Donkey Kong Country, a beautiful thing was born. And the sequel, Diddy's Conquest, was proof positive that this whole thing was not just a fluke. Rare went on to turn out a string of superb titles before you know what happened, but we won't get into that. And hey, there is still hope for them yet. Given the timing of everything, it is fortunate that they were able to get Banjo-Tooie released before the bottom dropped out. So here's the thing. Upon finishing Banjo-Kazooie, you will receive some interesting information from Mumbo. And I'm not talking about Stop and Swap, who even gives a sh- What I'm talking about is Mumbo's little trash talk at the end. While talking about the sequel, he says, Ooh, ah, uh, ooh, ah, uh, yo, ooh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ooh, ah, uh, ooh, ah. Uh. Well, I can't speak for everybody, but I know I was interested. Yet, at the same time, I was older, I was a little more cynical, and so I was cautious. When I heard those words from Mumbo, there was a part of me that thought, you know, he's probably just talking it up. You know how it is, right? You never want to get your hopes up too much. Well, guys, he's not talking it up. Banjo-Tooie actually does make the first game look like a joke. Okay, so let's just get this part out of the way. When Mumbo and I say joke, we don't mean that this game looks bad. We mean this game looks very small, because Banjo-Tooie is the kind of game that will not hesitate to kick your ass. But it's not even the game that's kicking your ass half the time, it's you kicking your own ass by running around for 16 hours trying to find your way around. You thought getting the jiggy in the engine room was bad? Actually... Okay, that one's still pretty bad. One of the hardest questions you could ask me is which of these two games is better? Banjo-Kazooie or Banjo-Tooie? Because I really don't know. I've never seen a case of two games being so similar and yet so different at the same time. See, when I was growing up, you never really knew what to expect from sequels. Sure, there were some like Mega Man and Castlevania where the sprites and controls felt mostly the same from one to the next. So you felt like if you were good at the first one, at least you had a head start going into the next one. But then there were others that seemingly changed everything. Just look at Nintendo's two key franchises, Mario and Zelda. Super Mario Bros. 2 and Zelda 2 were both radical departures from their originals. By the time the Super Nintendo came along, everything started looking really different. Mario was riding a dinosaur, and then he was a baby. Little Mac was ripped AF. Contra was cluttered, and everything moved twice as fast. Simon was 10 feet tall and whipping in eight directions. Samus was twice as big, shooting in eight directions. The thing is, it was getting to a point where being good at a game did not give you a free pass when playing the sequel. You often had a whole new skill set to learn, and this is not a bad thing. But this is why it was such a breath of fresh air, to me anyway, to discover that Banjo-Tooie plays almost identically to the first game. All of the moves you learned over the course of the first game carry straight on over, and you just pick right up where you left off. Even the story picks up right where the first game ended, albeit two years later, but still. The game offers you a host of new moves, impossible as it may seem. And with it comes a whole new aspect to the gameplay. It's adding to the original, not replacing it. I like that. But where do the differences lie? Well, let's start with the bad and go from there. For science, for one thing, there's the world itself. The name of the overworld, Isle of Hags, not that great. Grunty's lair really feels like the place where she lives, and you're gradually working your way up through it. The worlds feel like an extension of it. Isle Hags, on the other hand, feels just like a random series of outside areas. I mean, sure, you got the Hag 1 tracks going through, but it just doesn't feel as cohesive. This is where this world is. That is where that world is. The entrances to the worlds don't feel like a precursor to the world itself the way they did before. Bubble Gloop Swamp is a hut in the swamp. Mad Monster Mansion is set in the cool-ass graveyard. Click Clock Woods is inside a giant tree stump. But Hailfire Peaks? It's just through some door. 
I can't help but feel like they wanted to do more with this, but you and I both know they were running out of time. One of the other big issues with 2E was that sometimes it was just too big of a game for the Nintendo 64 to handle. The frame rate was almost unbearable in some instances. Now, as much as people harp on about the re-releases, I kind of feel like the differences are a small price to pay for how much smoother the games look and feel on the Xbox, but especially this one. I still maintain that my man Mumbo here is correct in the sense that this game makes the first one look like a joke, but as far as shamans go, he is not getting upstaged by Humble Wumba as far as I'm concerned. The main reason is because Mumbo's transformations were usually living things. A termite, an alligator, a walrus, a bee! Humbo's transformations are almost all machine. A washing machine, a detonator, a submarine, a van. Seriously, a van? She even rips off one of Mumbo. This is not to say that the transformations are any less fun to play with, but it does kind of take away that organic feel that the first game had. Banjo-Tooie is a lot more mechanical, a lot more metal. You ride in a spaceship, you go into lockers, trash cans, there's electric fences, giant magnets, crushing factories, oil rigs, and don't even get me started on grunty industries. Let me just try something here. Name your two least favorite worlds in Banjo-Kazooie. I'll give you a second to think about it. My odds of correctly guessing your answer are 1 in 36. You done? Okay, let's do this. Rusty Bucket Bay and Clanker's Cavern. Am I right? If I'm right, like, comment, subscribe! No, I'm pretty sure I'm not, but maybe, maybe the comments will let us know as time goes on. Here's the point I'm trying to make, is these are my two least favorite worlds in the first game, and you know what they have in common? They're mechanical! The whole garbage-eating metallic fish with boob lust coming from every orifice. It's just gross, man! And Rusty Bucket Bay? Well, I don't even need to explain that one. And this is not to say that all the worlds in Banjo-Tooie are bad. Pterodactyl Land looks pretty organic, and despite the aforementioned oil rig, the rest of Hailfire Peaks feels mostly natural. Jolly Rogers Bay is about as gorgeous as it can get. I guess to be fair, there are only so many biomes you can resort to, and one could argue that without the mechanical side of it, this game would have felt too much like the first. So in the end, I get why they did it. Most of my other gripes with Tooie are small things. The lack of Tootie herself as a character in the game, aside from the milk card cameo as one. But not getting to hear Grunty's trash talk all through the game really kind of puts a damper on the player's motivation to get up there and whoop her butt. The game show is nowhere near as exciting as it was the first time, nor is the final battle, but considering what they were up against, I can kind of understand. But here's the thing that really sets Tooie apart from Kazooie. The worlds in Tooie are HUGE! When Mumbo says Tooie makes the first game look like a joke, this is what he's talking about. I've probably played through Tooie at least five or six times in my life, and I still don't know my way around Glitter Gulch Mine. And that's the second world! See, a lot of the worlds in Kazooie were easy not to get lost in, because almost every single one of them was just a giant circle with something in the middle. Clanker's Cavern, giant circle, fish in the middle. Click Clock Wood, giant circle, big tree in the middle. Freeze Easy Peak, giant circle, big snowman in the middle. A lot of Tooie's worlds ain't like that. Okay, well at first they are. My Hem Temple is set around, well, the temple and Witchy World is set around the giant circus tent. After that, forget about it! I mean, technically, you could say the same for Grunty Industries, but only a tenth of that world actually happens outside of the building. And if you know your way around the inside of that place, well then, holy testicle Tuesday, my man. One way in which Tui remedies this problem, and I guess we're starting to kind of get into the good stuff here, is by adding warps into the world, so that you can fast travel to a lot of the important points within them. This helps tremendously. I mean, thank God they did this, because some of these worlds are an absolute bitch to get around. Sure, there's still flying, but flight pads are a lot more rare, and oftentimes a lot harder to get to. One of my favorite things about Banjo-Tooie is the way that the worlds are interconnected. In the first world, Mayhem Temple, you're gonna run into Dilberta, who can't go home because a giant rock is in her way. Later on, you run into her boyfriend? Okay. Anyway, he's in Glitter Gulch Mine, but the rock separating them is in Mayhem Temple. She's right on the other side. So you go back with the build drill, destroy the rock, and bam, you just opened up a passage straight from World 1 to World 2. There are all sorts of examples of this, and I love it! There's even a train station that will take you to any world you've been to already. It makes the worlds feel less like individual stages or levels, and more like parts of an actual world that you can just get immersed in. Okay, so remember how in the first game, you could get every Jiggy in every world the first time you went there, but then there's that one in Freeze Easy Peak that you can't get because you need the upgrade from World 6? Well, in Banjo-Tooie, there is a lot more of this, let me tell you. With all of the flippy flopping, warping around, half the time, you're not even gonna know which world some Jiggies count towards. There's this one Jiggy that you get from a couple of cavemen on the way out of Pterodactyl Land, but you'll need to bring them burgers from Witchy World, but you can't take the burgers out of Witchy World, so you have to go get some upgrade from Grunty's Industry so you can walk up the wall to take it to them. You're taking different pieces of 
each world and using them to help out in other worlds. Something about it just feels nice, like there's this whole community of dwellers, each with their own problems, and you have to figure out what they need. So let's talk about Cheeto for a minute. I remember being pretty excited when I first found out about Cheeto and Banjo-Kazooie. I had no idea what sorts of spells or abilities he could offer, but I was a little underwhelmed to discover that all they really did was double your inventory space. Like, when am I ever gonna need 200 eggs? Even a filthy casual like me would have no problem beating Grunty without these upgrades. Well, Cheeto and banjo Tui is a little more interesting. Hiding out in the sadly defunct remains of Grunty's lair, Cheeto reveals that Grunty tore out his pages for helping you in the first game. Wonder when she found time to do that. As you retrieve the lost pages, you turn them in for some pretty sweet upgrades. The usual inventory space doubler is there, but because of certain things, it's actually useful here. Fallproof? Man, what I wouldn't give to have had this one in the first game. It's also homing edge, which is freaking awesome, and an auto-regen type ability that constantly refills your energy, but to be fair, it's a little bit game-breaking. There's just so many little things about Tui that I feel surpass the original. Jam Jars is a cool cat, and apparently he picks up where Grunty left off with the rhymes. There are five different types of eggs, and they're all useful. There's also the first-person shooter sections, which are fun as hell. You don't have to worry about the future anymore, because now we have unlimited lives. Characters from the first game come back in funny ways. Klungo, Boggy, Gobi, even Logo the Toilet! The Toilet. The music is just as great as the first. Notes and other pickups now come in little packages of five, so no more of this running around with 99 notes wondering where the hell that last one is. I didn't even talk about Mumbo's role in all of it, but it's not like you don't know already. Just the fact that you get to explore each world as potentially five different forms that's incredible. So let's just cut through the whole crap cake here. After all this, the question still remains. Which is the better game? Well, to be honest, when people ask me this question, my usual answer is Banjo-Tooie. And based on the five or so days I've spent putting this stupid-ass script together, I suppose that has been the right answer for me anyway. But hey... I bet you thought I was gonna say that's just a theory, right? Get out of here.